Okay, so um, <clears throat> okay, so um, so thank you again for staying uh, in for the last lecture. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, switch gear to talk about the deep reinforcement learning for knowledge graph based uh, plasticity model. Uh, I would like to again acknowledge the contributor of this talk, uh, my former student Kun Wong, who did uh, most, if not 99.9% .9 of the programming, and then uh, my new student uh, Bahato uh, Mamini for preparing the, uh, the, the Jupyter um, uh, tutorial. Okay, so I would like to first um, begin because we are afternoon in a layer mode. I would like to start with um, the code from uh, Trustel and No. So the theory of the virus is to bring order into the chaos of the phenomena of nature and immense language by which a cast of physical phenomena can be described effectively and simply. But we also know that if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. So here, what is a lion? Uh, our predictions generated from neural network could be something that are really hard to understand or interpret. But then the real question is that how, how do we measure what is uh, interpretable and what is the right way to actually enhancing it? So first I would like to give uh, a review of what does intelligibility means? What do you mean uh, model is intelligible? Uh, from the um, previous work, uh, this is a relatively recent work published in the PNAS. It talked about the uh, intelligibility in machine learning. Uh, basically, we can classify it into two types of intelligibility, the model-based intelligibility and the post hoc intelligibility. Model-based intelligibility is that uh, we will use various means to introduce a system that can, that can increase the descriptive accuracy. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I can give for example, for example, uh, let's say we want to create a label to identify Panda from, uh, from a loss of image, okay? So um, uh, we can actually increase a loss of accuracy by, uh, by making sure that by uh, uh, having more data that are actually seeing the, the panda in a bamboo forest. But then the, when you make the improvement on the predictions, the improvement could be due to the bamboo, not because of the feature of the, uh, of, of the panda. But uh, on the other hand, we can increase the descriptive accuracy by introducing a way to explain the decisions of creating such a label. For example, you can argue that uh, we can use the machine learning to identify the eyes, the nose, or the whatever physical feature, and then using that feature to make the predictions instead of uh, simply using a singular value decomposition or whatever mean that create a low dimensional structure. Um, interpretability sometimes can also increase the robustness because that gives us another mean to actually um, uh, control the, the, the reasoning of the outcome. <clears throat> another uh, interpretability commonly in machine learning is the post hoc interpretability. I think in the modeling we show a little bit, uh, we can create a learn model and then check whether the resultant permeability is positive definite whether the elasticity, energy functional, have elliptricity, so on and so forth. But in order to create a model that have uh, enhanced interability, we need to think about uh, not just to building a focus engine, but how do we abstract, uh, how create an abstraction of knowledge that are create from the machine learning. So in other words, we need the tools for us to carry that structural knowledge or, or capture the relationships and then using it, uh, not only to build a better focusing engines, uh, but to understand the reasoning. One of the possibility is actually to generate instead of just the predictions, a knowledge graph. We talk about a lot of graph in the morning, but then, uh, but most of them are actually weight graph or unweight graph, meaning that those entities that are connected by the edge doesn't necessarily have a hierarchical or directional relationships. 
Um, <clears throat> for example, uh, fanship is something that is hard to describe uh, with a directions, but um, but a parenthood or the parent and son relationships can inherently create by a directional vector. In fact, the holy grant of the computer vision is actually to not just to create a low dimensional information to interpret image, but to comprehend the information and then carry it in a proper format. So shown here, of course, it's not uh, my results. It's actually just downloaded from the Stanford AI lab. Uh, you can see that the, a picture of a horseman uh, or actually a man that are actually feeding a horse. So in this case, in their computer algorithm, uh, what they, instead of uh, finding the low dimensional or try, try to conduct a, a singular value decompositions on the image, what well, the, the data deductions is actually to converge it into a graph that contain relatively the same information of the image without the image that are not necessary for the purpose, for whatever purpose they propose. You can see in that, uh, in this case, we can see the man, we can see the horse, we can see the grass, but you won't have any image, uh, we won't have any image about the color of the horse, for example, if, if, if this is preserved as unimportant. Another thing we can see is that a uh, knowledge graph in a lot of time, uh, in a lot of knowledge graph, I actually have directions. It tell you what the relationship between the uh, uh, receiver and then also the, the upstream information. Like family tree is a specific type of the um, of a graph that tell you the that tell you the hierarchical relationships, um, citation network, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so um, this is different than the geometric learning we talk about because those are on the unway graph that have no directions. Now, what does it have to do with the physics? The way we actually can think about it is that if you look at the final element or the PDU solver or the Markov method, they are inherently also a direct graph because we have the constraint and the upstream, but those constraints that we try to control are actually controlled by the downstream parameter. For example, we, uh, we build a displacement-based final element. The displacement is actually the downstream that gives us the string. From the string, we get the stress. From the stress, uh, we actually constrain the stress and then back propagate it into a uh, displacement field. Okay, so the interesting part is that when we write, when we try to deduct the equations, uh, can we actually decompose it into two ways, not just try to uh, using a symbol, symbolic regression to find a uh, very complex, um, <clears throat> to search for very complex form of mathematical equations, but instead first define the structure uh, of the knowledge in that data and then substitute it with the right equations. So that's the, um, the central philosophy of the, uh, this part of the talk. Uh, I want to mention that uh, the realization that graph is actually, um, can be used to represent uh, <clears throat> topological space is actually uh, known, be known, for example, we can using it to uh, uh, capture um, uh, factor uh, by actually consider a file level mesh as a, as a tree that actually have pawn and then pawn form a segment, segment form a, a, a area, area form a volume, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you think about the final element, uh, if you implement a return mapping or whatever algorithm that predicts stress and string, and in this time, we don't necessarily use the new network to make such a predictions, although we can. We can also think about it as an information flow where we actually predict a stress from a string and an internal variable or history that evolve. And uh, one of the interesting thing is that the previous existing constituted law that we can find in the literature in many cases can also be generated as a knowledge graph. So the one of the interesting questions is that if we actually have an existing material library that contain a lot of different strategy from the previous famous or really skillful modeler, you collect a large amount of the strategy, how do we deploy it to a new situations when you actually have a new material that the previous strategy has not been employed? Okay, so that comes from the fact that 
if you want to generate the knowledge that uh, create an abstraction, how do we generating the graph? And if we can generate a graph, how do we use the graph? So this idea of combining the more uh, the model or, or, uh, or the AI, more AI approach um, to mechanics, um, maybe not connect to mechanics, but the pure AI approach can go all the way back to uh, Alan Tuning. So the key idea is that if you think about um, uh, when a human trying to learn something, uh, unlike a supervised learning, we are not necessarily all the time have the label that are actually optimize the behavior. Okay, you may think about it at the beginning of we want to study something, we may have no experiment data, we may start with nothing. And we intact with the environment, we try to do different things, and then we collect the knowledge, and then we create the best strategy to do something. So the, the important idea from Alan Tuning is that instead of trying to produce a program that simulate the adult mind, a very mature predictor of focusing engines, why not rather try to produce one that simulate a child that try to learn the process of creating a program? Because if you can successfully generate an AI that behaves like a child, it's actually create a lot of opportunity to be grow into an adult instead of uh, each time we actually need to train something, build a robot that resembles a very experienced modeler that are really complicated. So this is the idea or the idea of why we want to introduce the reinforcement learning into the, into the constitutive modeling. Of course, the idea is not limited to constitutive model. We can do many, many other things. And then I will show some of the example of how to apply the reinforcement learning uh, into different applications related to uh, mechanics and physics world. Uh, so what is the, actually the difference in terms of the learning part? Uh, and I think that a lot of time, the learning part is actually what's set apart from the unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and the reinforcement learning. Uh, in uh, reinforcement learning, we are actually, that the computer is actually not to tune a parameter or, 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 or operate necessary in a continuum space. Uh, the computer instead is choosing a set of actions that actually lead to a consequence. Okay, so like a supervised learning, it could also have a goal. Uh, for example, I can actually, well, I want to know in this Super Mario case, uh, should I continue to pass the forward button or should I actually pass jump in order to actually score the maximum point? So the point itself, uh, the score itself here can be the loose functions. It, may, it can be formally as a loss function, just like a supervised learning. But my, my, but my decisions or my actions could have a combination of continual and discrete actions. And the uh, reinforcement learning focus more on making a set of a uh, very uh, uh, long uh, range of, uh, of planning and, and decisions such that it can achieve a goal as much as it can. So the situations can be applied to a uh, goal. I think right now there are millions of talk talk about this. Uh, so I'll just skip or Super Mario or Starcraft. In this, in each case, you see the different dimension of the game. But I would like to say that if you want to control a new uh, experiment, whether it's a simulate experiment like shear test or uh, actual physical experiment that are very expensive, like capturing a micro CT of image of a uh, of an interjected material or whatever, I just make up something. Then you also involve the, the selection of the action that maximize the outcome. The outcome could be uh, whether I can use that experimental data most intelligently to actually make uh, the best predictions or write a good model, or we can, or which if, if I actually have a fixed amount of the money to invest on certain uh, experimental activity, what would be the right way so that I can know again most knowledge that are measurable. So um, the ingredient is the actions, is the reward, and also the panning part. So I would just uh, use a very uh, simple example to illustrate the idea of the panning. So this is actually uh, the map in Livermore, California. So um, so a little bit personal history, I used to work there and I want to find the shortest way to go home. And then, uh, so this is actually the graph of the map 
okay, so what should I do? Um, so I know all the possible way I can go left, I can go right. So one way we can do is that we, are, we just search for the shortest path is that we basically try all the different combination of the possibility of going from, uh, from uh, the national lab all the way to the airport. Okay, if we try all the possible way, we can also find it. And in this case, in a small problem, we can certainly do that by using a technique called spanning tree. I'm at point one and I go to point two and I go to point three. Now point three from point one would take point eight mile, but then I can actually continue to go to the East Avenue or I can go up and then they will lead to different, uh, um, uh, different um, uh, uh, distance. So what I actually need to do is just to record those distance at the nodes and then I keep expanding the tree. Okay, once I reach that point, I will have 19. And then the important thing is that I can look back, pop back, propagate into node one to find out what is the best, uh, what is the distance from point one to point eight. In that spanning tree case, because in each choice, each, each time I have a multiple choice, I would choose the shortest path uh, to actually expand the tree. This is a minimum spanning tree. So the first time I actually hit the, the distance uh, and, and the values of that nooks would actually be the shortest distance. So this is a very small dimensional problem compared to paying a chess or paying a go. So in this case, the values of each position are directly put into the nooks. So now, but then, the important thing is that uh, no one would using it to pay uh, chess, pay and go, or actually design an experiment. The reason is that in those case, uh, in each time step, or in you have so many, so many different choice that can e essentially lead to a problem that you cannot visit all the possibility and then find and then rank it uh, to find the best uh, uh, way to actually model the problem. So in this case, we need the machine learning to help us to actually improve the panning and the explorations to create a resultant model. So uh, we here we invent the game to actually generate a type of knowledge graph that are focused on maximizing predictions. Uh, so we will actually define a new game, kind of like invents the game of Go. Uh, we have multiple unknown uh, for each of the vertex. Uh, those are the physical measurable uh, parameter. For example, the void ratios of the voids, uh, the fiber cancer, the dimensions, the on average, how many part particle neighborhood it has, these locations, density, all the time history data. Uh, again, like what we previously talked about, you can think about it like a, Excel, uh, like a data with Excel spreadsheets that show the time history. Well, we have no idea how to link it in the best way possible in order to create the predictions. So the, the dimensions of the game is actually uh, related to how many different ways to link those predictions uh, uh, to create a focusing engines that reaching the, that reach from the roots node to the leaf looks. In this case, we try to generate a Jackson separation law. So the input is actually the relative displacement history and then the output is the tractions, okay? So instead of directly predicting the relative displacement to the tractions, I want to know whether I can build a graph so that I, I can explain the physics of why we have that tractions. So this is actually one example we want to saying that, okay, because of the relative displacement, uh, we will actually uh, lead to uh, increase of the porosity and that lead to uh, that lead to also lead to the change of the fiber tensor and then that rotate the string tensor and lead to the checksons, uh, uh, lead to a certain amount of checksons being generated. We want to generate that explanations qualitatively, just like the previous figure on the, on the computer vision on the horse example, or a horse and man picture example to create a reasoning, but at the same time, we want to create a focusing engine. So what we actually need to do is that we will use uh, deep reinforcement learning to actually create the, the direct graph that actually represent the knowledge that we gain uh, from try and error. And then we will use, um, we will break down uh, uh, a knowledge system represented by a direct graph into multiple 
uh, a subgraph, and each graph would actually have a parents and a child uh, set of nodes. For the nodes in the same generations, they would be the they would either be the input and output of the new network, and then it pushed to the next generation. So in this example, uh, I actually uh, from the reinforcement learning, I would actually create a input that take uh, node one and node two. Uh, as the input, and uh, my ultimate goal is to predict uh, node sex. But instead of directly predicting node sex, uh, node sex, I would actually first uh, using node one and node two to predict uh, four and five, and then I, I then I will propagate the information to create a supervised learning. So the reinforcement learning in this particular problem is to design the program, uh, the most feasible uh, um, explanations of the connection mechanism uh, that actually also lead to the best focusing score. So we want to build a focusing engine that can be as generalized as possible at uh, the score uh, and then predict it as accurate as possible. Uh, but we don't make a pie assumption about what strategy we want to make. We just make all of them available. We can actually put uh, long short term memory there, recurrent neural network there or mathematical equation that we don't care. We make it all available. And then we use the try and error to distill what is the best way to do something. Okay, so in other words, out of all the possible way to actually connect the physical uh, constraint, oh, uh, we want to use the reinforcement learning to learn how to actually create a graph that best uh, generate the predictions and explanations. Okay, so I will just skip this slide and then the, uh, we can see the results here. Uh, uh, I would first show the results and then I would actually talk about the details about the training. So I think that this is probably a lot in the literature this day. Uh, in the reinforcement learning in Google, uh, in the AlphaGo Zero, you can see that uh, the initial training, uh, the, the, um, the computer AI payer actually pay pretty badly in Go. You just put a uh, piece randomly. And after uh, increasing amount of training time, uh, then the, then the uh, agent uh, continue to develop the expertise and pay like a master. This is actually uh, the constant duty law game. So what we want to know is that if we can actually control the AI to try different way to model something, eventually can it reach a level of a human expert to predict, uh, to generate a focusing engine that are as good uh, as it could be. So this is a checks on the separation law. Initially, uh, the connections have no mathematical, uh, doesn't make sense physically. It just randomly connect the, the relative displacement with porosity and then use porosity, which is a scalar to be the character. But over the time, uh, the connections actually improve. So what I want to achieve in the rest of the lecture is that uh, how to generate such improvement using the uh, experience uh, that are controlled by the, by the reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, just a recap. We want to actually create a meta modeling game that with all the possible way of uh, generating a model, uh, we want to find what is the best way. Okay, so this up to now, this is actually can be achieved by reinforcement learning. But what, uh, what is the recent breakthrough is not just the reinforcement learning, but the deep reinforcement learning. So what is the deep part here? So this is something that uh, we need to get into the details of the reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, but long story short, the, the, the reason that deep reinforcement learning, uh, the deep part become important is related to the number of legal positions. So uh, I think you probably hear it or maybe a loss of audience hear it a loss of time in paying the goal uh, the number of possible way to pay the goal is two to 170, which is actually way more than the number of the total atom in the atom in the universe, which is actually very different than the Livermore traveling case. If I want to go home, I just try 30 different time and then I rank each one of them. And then I can probably find the optimum way absolutely clear. But uh, if you pay a chance or go, the new each game is sort of unique or it generate uh, illusion that is unique 
or even though it's a finite game, is because of the enormous uh, dimension in the decision tree. Uh, in defining the game, we can actually control that dimension. So for example, uh, in this reinforcement learning game, where we have absolutely no mechanics knowledge, the number of legal positions is only 5 million. So when we say only 5 million, it looks very not that much compared to 2 to 170. But uh, you are not going to ask a graduate student to put 5 million model just to pick the best one. Okay, but you can ask the computer. So this is actually the major difference that uh, that, that we need to think about that. We may want to, may, we may not want to write 5 million, so we may, we may we even want to write 5 million model and pick the best one, or we probably want, don't want to write 5 trillion model or we cannot do it. Okay, so the important thing of the reinforcement learning is that how can we economically sampling the space and improving our knowledge, whatever it is to store into the, into the uh, new network and then make a better predictions. Okay, so um, uh, here I would like to talk about it. Um, we already consume 26 minutes and I get into the deep reinforcement learning. There are uh, online resources in YouTube that teach much better deep reinforcement learning than me. Uh, and you can actually find it from Google DeepMind and they, with the expertise that pay a gigantic amount of salary, they require 10 costs and we have half 30 minutes. So I will not talk about all the details, but you can find it easily, for example, from Google DeepMind. But I want to overall, my focus is on how to apply those 10 costs of knowledge, which by the way, I also personally just learned from YouTube. <laughs> to apply it to the mechanics problem, okay? So there are some basic ingredients that are require us to understand uh, that, uh, that, uh, that require us to cope a uh, reinforcement learning problem. We need the agents, again, uh, it can be human or AI. Um, it could be your student, okay? So, and then we need a state that represent the current uh, state of the uh, constitutive law. I stay here because we use a graph abstraction of knowledge so a state of the constitutive law is basically currently how these nodes are connected to each other and how a new network actually predict the response. And then here, uh, I will constitute the game with, with resolving to actions to the connections. This is related to in the philosophy connectionism, but the long story short, uh, we will just actually use the action to explore different way to create, uh, create uh, uh, predictions inside your predictions. How do we connect different physical quality together? But you can expand the action to include other things. For example, you can uh, simultaneously think about how do I relate the dislocation density to the passive string, while you're also thinking about what is the new network uh, layer, that uh, number of layer I want to use. Then I will have a bigger action space. And from that action, back to action space, then I increase the complexity of the problem. But this is something we can control. And the other thing is the reward. Um, the reward is actually like paying chess or paying uh, a goal. You only know the quality of the model at the end. And in this case, the agent is writing a model. And the model is sub subjected to an environment. In the Super Mario, the environment is a computer screen. And we use some convolutional neural network to interact with the environment. Here, the environment could be a direct numerical simulation, a virtual experiment, or simply an experimentalist that actually tell you how good the model is. And then the model, and then for example, the L2 norm of the stress measure in the experiment and your predictions, which you often see in classical uh, mechanics literature. And that leads to the reward. The most important thing is that this process is actually uh, repeated psychologically uh, cyclically. So in the classical supervised learning way, you're already given all the data at once, okay? And then you try to mine the best way to actually build a model. But here, we actually can start from nothing. We can also have an action of an experimentalist to generating the data while we're writing the model. So we have a different way to explore our problem and improve our model with all the strategy or all the arsenal of uh, technique we have. So, but in any case, what we want to, what we actually want to find is the key values. 
uh, we want to actually find out that if I take certain actions, what is the reward compared to the other actions? So for example, if I want to, uh, um, if I want to use a hardening law X that are associative versus non-associative, what is actually the relative reward I would get quantitatively, not uh, based on uh, a law measurable intuitions. Okay, so the reinforcement learning is a little bit like uh, we practice basketball. It has uh, observations from the environment, the observations gen generate a reward. And then based on the reward, we adjust our actions and then we do it multiple times. So the necessary ingredient is that we need the agents and we need the environments and then we need the interactions. So in a classical way, the deep reinforcement learning require uh, the gaining of experiment and then the gaining of experiment allow us to improve our predictions on the values of the action we take. Okay, but in the case where you have so many options and you cannot actually uh, um, visit everywhere or actually sample it enough, we need to use the statistic of the, of the expect values of the reward. And we also need to predict what is the outcome of the values of each actions. So the deep reinforcement learning part come from the model. So in the deep reinforcement learning case, we have a model phase, uh, model based reinforcement learning. Uh, so the, the spanning tree problem doesn't require a model, but here we will actually have a model. And that model is not a constituted law. It's a model that given a certain actions, uh, sorry, given a certain state, the model actually output which action that would maximize my move. Okay, in the case of paying the chest, Okay, so how did the computer decide whether the base ship should move or the palm should move or the king should move? It's actually because in each different action is assigned a value to it. And then you pick the one that maximize the current values. Okay, so here we have two neural network in this or multiple neural network. One or the model. One model is the constitutive model itself. Another model that we are keep training and improving through experiment it's actually the decision-making model that actually uh, create the actions uh, from the neural network. So uh, we, have, um, we have the same environment in this case. In this numerical experiment, the environment is simply uh, computer simulations uh, because I'm not an experimentalist. And then, uh, and then uh, I so far have not yet able to convince any of my students to do experiment. So, Maybe that would be a warrior willing to do that. But until then, I will use uh, numerical simulations. Um, and then it generate the database. And then we will actually have a score. So here we can define whatever score, like what we talk about. Uh, here we actually want to do something that uh, more reliable. So we want to actually weigh, uh, we want to create a model that uh, actually after it generates sufficiently fast, but also accurate. So, and then, and then that would actually affect the choice. So we actually create uh, a matrix, a quantitative matrix. We actually put the execution time of the model, um, the, the, how good it make predictions with the calibration data and how good it make um, prediction for the forward prediction data. And then we lump that criteria together and we try to maximize the, the predictions. Uh, so um, the neural network basically is to create uh, the right uh, connectivity of the physical unknown and then create change a new network. Okay, so when you think about it, like what we talk about, um, and also uh, Professor Chen talked a little bit about, so the, the picking of individual nodes that are getting connect is not a continuous discuss, uh, uh, a decision, it's a discrete decisions, and then, in this particular case, we need a sequence of a discrete uh, decisions. So how do we try, how do we do it? Like the first one is that we try all the possibility. Okay. Uh, and this is actually certainly possible when the possibility of configuration is very small. Uh, but in other, in other case, uh, we may actually simply want to try, if I try three things that work, maybe I should continue trying this thing and then maximize my likelihood of actually get a good behavior. Uh, this is a lot of time while how we manually tune hyperparameter. 
I just uh, actually find out what is the action step actually maximize my expected return. And then that would be, uh, for example, happen in a pure greedy algorithm. But then the, the, the following problem exists because um, we may actually have some other way to think about the problem and to connect the problem that actually you are much better predictions that we don't know. And if we actually, if each time we just uh, go to the direction that maximize that possibility, we may not explore the unknown enough in that decision tree to yield a good strategy. So there is a need to balance the, the trade-off between uh, optimizing the uh, good behavior and then uh, exploration. And then that require that, and then uh, that requires specific technique to balance the two trade off and then control uh, the, the dimensions. So in the finding the hyperparameter, you can actually come and see this dynamic. I actually have some good behavior on one set of the constitutive law that I train, but then there's a new thing coming out and then I have no knowledge of this. Should I try the new one? What is the reward if I actually engage in these actions? So, um, so here we did not do anything new except that uh, we just use a classical Monte Carlo tree search. So the idea is that um, we would actually try to balance the explorations and then the, 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 the need to optimize the behavior uh, by uh, actually using uh, upper confident bond. The upper confident bond uh, contain two, um, two uh, components. The first component is the key values. The key value is simply what is the mean uh, uh, values I obtain from engaging in certain behavior. Like for example, if I train attraction separation law and then I actually incorporate a porosity on average, what, what do I get by incorporating that, uh, uh, um, that, that actions? And then another one is actually the explorations. Now, the, because we make a sequence of decisions, this is, you think about it, this is a decision tree that going from the root nodes to the leaf. And then in the upper part, you always have to go through certain path. So the, you statistically, you converge more by visiting the type, uh, the, the same bench more uh, and to reach the total uh, statistics. So um, the, the, the confidence uh, actually increased if we actually visit the same, if we use the same type of strategy in our explorations program multiple times and then get a different score. Because in that case, in the, eventually the probability distributions of that actions would be converged if or if it's actually visit enough time. Uh, so, but if not, then we have lower confidence about that, uh, that uh, values of, our, uh, of the actions. And then we can probably uh, take advantage of uh, more explorations because even though you actually get a certain values of the uh, key values that may be based on uh, uh, an insufficient visit. Okay, so this is actually the monocology search. So we have in, in the, what we actually did is that we would actually try to build a model and we see how good it is. And then once we know how good it is, we need to back propagating uh, the values of each individual action that lead to the model. Uh, here is one example uh, of the cell page. So uh, this is uh, Marcus decision train process. In this case, uh, because we use a connection model, so we each time we connect it, a um, uh, 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 new nodes, we actually the actions we need to update of the state because now the constituted law is closer to completions. And then, the, and then at the end, it will generate, uh, we will interact with the experimentalists to create the values of how good that model is. And then what the neural network did is actually updating the policy uh, value and the value functions that tell us how good that model is. Uh, this could be done in when you have a single agent, but we can also do it in a cooperative game where we have a data agents that uh, are in charge of creating experiment and we have a model agents that are actually in charge of uh, creating a model and they can interact with their own action space and share the same score at the end of the, the learning. Okay, so the Mondo search uh, is actually the trick is the following. 
we will combine the new network learning for making the new network that make the uh, better uh, predictions. Uh, we will combine the learning and the planning together. We will train another new network with supervised learning. That supervised uh, learning, uh, that new network is actually not in charge of creating the stress strain curve, but instead try to figure out what is the relative values of a certain modeling strategy uh, given a current state of the model. So say I want to write a plasticity model, I will come up first with uh, picking what is the elasticity model, and then I will pick what is the yield functions, then I will pick how do we actually uh, hardening it, should I have to use a plastic potential? So in each state of it, I I'm giving a multiple choice what I want to know if, uh, if I'm in certain state of uh, making a fixed decision of the model, what is the values of that current model, and what is the policy probability that for us to generate the model. So this is a supervised learning model that given the state as the input, we out, output the policy probability and the values of the functions. Now then on the KS3 search is due in the following. In each time, we would actually make a decision to create a model. And then at the, at the, at the end of the decision tree, we would actually expand, meaning that we will actually uh, at that end, after we make the decision, we would actually uh, expand the tree and then, uh, and then make one additional connection. So you see here, in particular, this decision is made. I'm, I'm going to write a model in this way, but I also want to see if I add an edge there, or I actually write a model in a slightly different way, what would be the change of the, of the quality of the model. And after we have that uh, uh, update, uh, we will actually create a new predictions from the environment. After we make the decision, we retrain the new network. We actually back propagate the key values, which tell us the value of the action back from the end of the decision all the way back to the earlier decision. Then we have an update decision tree with our update key values, and then we will update the decision process. So what you see here is actually uh, the traction separation law that are trained by the reinforcement learning. Uh, you can see the child that are here initially is really like a child that randomly draws something, even though we're giving a stress ring curve. But the, the, the focus here is the, instead of trying to generate a good model here, we are trying to explore different ways to write the model and then eventually come up with a good model. In this particular Jackson separation mill problem, there are actually uh, only required 75 uh, episodes of explorations, and then it can already lead to a model that relatively performed well. Uh, we can also, so this is actually uh, purely uh, based on the knowledge graph that are on connections. We can also create a more restricted way to uh, actually incorporate it into uh, into a model similar to symbolic regressions. But in the symbolic regressions, we basically treat all the expressions as the expression tree and then the reinforcement learning, which by the way, has wonderful work. Uh, I have seen done in the recent year, maybe for, uh, for example, the, you can find an open source code from the Peterson paper from Lawrence Livermore that explain uh, the, the tree that represent a mathematical expression and how to find the optimum tree but what you can see is that in general, those problems are actually limited to one or two dimensions because symbolic regression is really hard or really hard to explore in high dimensions. Here, we actually can design a more constrained way. We just, uh, this is actually a little bit like going to McDonald's and you order a dinner. So you can actually order a burger coupled with different drink and different size. So you can view the possibility model in this uh, way that we have different elasticity strategy, yield function strategy, and potential strategy. You may, you may not want to exploit it manually because the elasticity strategy there may be a couple hundred of them. The yield functions there could be also a couple hundred and then plastic potential may be a similar number. But what the reinforcement learning can do is actually the repeat the try and error and then leveraging the Monte Carlo tree search to effectively use the sampling to cure the, to overcome the curse of high dimensionality. Uh, so we first do a reverse engineering problem. 
uh, and uh, we actually introduce uh, a model that uh, library that collect all the strategy of different way to write a constitutive model from the literature. Not all the strategy, but the strategy that uh, based on our research group workforce can implement. <laughs> okay, so maybe, um, yeah, I know um, maybe 20 of them uh, in each one. Uh, um, maybe we should expand it, right? So, um, but, um, but we actually create a substantial size that are actually not uh, is large enough that uh, no one would try it manually and then we try to create a model. So the, the reverse engineering uh, exercise is not to explore anything new, but just check that if I keep give, give the computer a perfect J2 positivity data, a perfect Jupyter project data, or a perfect fee invariance yield function data, can the AI learn to discover all the detailed components that are actually in there, correctly identify all the detail of how to write a constitutive log? So you can see that uh, possibly because the space is also not so large, it can actually convert very fast. Within 10 episodes, uh, the model actually recover every details of that constitutive log. So this actually creates uh, flexibility because in general, uh, you would need to do it manually. You see a data set, okay, you say that, okay, this look like a J2 positivity. Let me try to put a J2 positivity. And then you need to figure out whether there's a, what kind of hardening you do that. Uh, you actually try to do it manually, but it would be good to also use the automate uh, idea to recover, regenerate the, uh, the model from a meta model that, in, that already, um, made those strategies available and come up with a new solutions or Frankenstein type of solutions, okay, to generate predictions. Uh, and we can also apply it in the inverse problem for the final elements. So again, through the try and error, uh, with enough iterations, we can eventually matching the benchmark uh, experimental results. Uh, so we still have 10 minutes. So the last thing I want to do is uh, to say is that we start with uh, single agents that are writing the model, and then we work on the two agent problem where we have an experimentalist and then a modeler to interact with each other to actually create a model that keep improving. But what if we have two experimentalists and one modeler, and then one experimentalist is not necessarily try to write a model uh, to calibrate a model, but also uh, want to make the, also want to uh, spot the weakness of the model. Okay, so in a sense, we would actually have a competitive mechanism. You can think about it as a modeler and the experiment, one experimentalist is in one team and then another experimentalist in the Apollo uh, team to expose the weakness. So this could actually, the reason we did that is that we want to uh, prevent the case where we cherry picking some good behavior, but not knowing there's a hidden weakness. If we actually create an agent, the only, and then we actually try to create the experiment that export the uh, weakness and the only concentrate on that part by exploring it, the, 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 the decision tree opposite, in the opposite manner, we can certainly find out the weakness, not just for any new network model we generate, but all the model that already exists in the history of mechanics, we can know what the model can or cannot do. So this is actually the big picture. And that has been used in robotics a lot of time. We want to create a robot arm that grab a stuff in a very robust manner. We create a protagonist, but also a advisory attack to actually train the, the protagonist to actually grab something in a more robust manner. So here, this is actually the problem. Uh, in this case, for simplicity, I will just fix the model and just calibrate the, uh, the material parameter. But we would actually like to have a non-cooperative game that the two agents are compete against each other and have the ability to exchange information to improve the robustness of the model. Uh, so I will give some details. The idea of the reinforcement learning part is almost identical except that they are actually working on the opposite of each other, try to compete against each other. Uh, and this is actually purely uh, with two agents that are given the same type of actions. By the way, the action doesn't need to be symmetric. You can give the attacker more tools 
and the modular last two so vice versa. But here we just simply using a DM simulations with the ability to conduct any type of uh, traxel compaction extension and two traxel tests. And then for a fixed model, we want to actually find out what is the weakness. And then we also predefined the experimental program. So uh, it's actually to do the experiment in a smaller dimensions. Um, we basically conduct our traxel test, but we only allow it to be conduct in certain pre-confined passer and certain loading path just to reduce the simplicity for that numerical experiment. Okay, so we have different choice. We can have a cyclic loading of different cycle, uh, but we also want to measure the, we want to see if the goal, if we have two agents and then the, the modeling agents cannot completely control the environment to create a very good model, so what would happen? Okay, so in order to do that, we need to reward the advisory and then the protagonist differently. In this case, it's almost uh, opposite. <clears throat> so the, the higher the score of the model, which means that the higher it, uh, it is to, predict, uh, to generate good prediction, the less reward the advisory will get, but then the more the protagonist uh, will get. So they can directly compete against each other. The score is in the negative directions. So there are two scores. The score of the protagonist is the score corresponding to the experimental data that are generated by the protagonist. And then the score of the advisory uh, for the attacker is actually the experimental tests that are generated by the attack person, oh, sorry, attack AI. So, so they are interact with each other. And I just want to show some experiment that uh, the paper is published in uh, very recently in CMME. So we just uh, performed an experiment that we already obviously know the result. This is a Jupyter program with isotropic hardening. So no one would using it to model a cyclic response because it's not designed to do that. In this case, uh, the, you can see that in the early game, they have simply just explored different numerical experiment and get a different score. It almost get a random behavior. As you play the game longer, the, the Q table that the, both the modeler and uh, sorry, both, both the protagonist and also the attack agents are gaining more experience. They know what is the strength and the weakness of the model. And you can see that. So for the Juke Praga, uh, for the protagonist, they will focus on uh, basically training uh, monotonic loading. And this is actually the, 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 the type of loading program that can actually give a high score, that can actually help the predictions. But what the attacker did is just fixture on those uh, cyclic loading with certain load where the model are not designed to actually conduct cyclic loading. We can also uh, compare it with a more sophisticated program and we see a similar trend here. Uh, initially, the predictions is actually uh, very, um, random, but eventually, uh, usually, uh, if you want to maximize the score of the predictions, you lead to a very simple say, uh, monotonic loading where the, the weakness are usually attacked from the, from the cyclic loading, which is actually not surprising. And what actually kind of surprising is in the last experiment, in which case we're seeing that uh, the neural network uh, model actually already performed really well very early on. Okay, uh, from, the, from the two agent game. So when you don't have a worse, when you don't, when the AI environment doesn't have someone to tell, to expose the weakness of the model, it create a very, um, how to say, uh, very um, positive feeling scenario. It looks like everything is missing the chest, uh, stress string response. But if you look at the attacker, they can still find the weakness of the model. So you see the, the traction separation law, if you are loading it, purposely load it in a certain way, the neural network actually would completely fail in those hidden loading directions, which actually meaning that locally, the model is very predictive, but if you apply it to a general loading program, there could be some loading history that the model performed terribly. Uh, but at the end of the loading, what is actually interesting is that the score of the defender actually go down, but the attacker become less successful. 
Okay, you can see here the stress strain curve uh, actually for the protagonist doesn't make that much change qualitatively. You see the red curve and the blue curve are very similar, but what you can see is the increase of the robustness. Okay, so now uh, uh, even the worst case I can generate to attack the model actually create a pretty good stress strain curve. Okay, but you cannot knowing that if we don't exploring uh, the, the dimension of the loading that are actually very weak. Uh, because uh, for, for the two agent program, there's no incentive to visit those witness to improve the performance score. So the attacker here is actually very important to uh, improve not necessarily the accuracy, but the guarantee the robustness of the predictions. One thing that could be also important to experimentalists is that um, a lot of time when we design the experiment is usually designed in a completely um, empirical manner. So we deal with our intuitions about this is the experimental program that are probably useful. And you can argue that if uh, everything is linear elastic, that is probably true because I just need to do a universal test, maybe in multiple directions, I eventually I will get the loading. But it becomes also clear if you have a compact microstructure, if you have a dislocations, if you have many, many things going on and uh, experiment, ex experiment is expensive. If I can only conduct 10 experiments, so how should, what should I do? So should I just based on my intuitions, maybe for very good experimentalists, their intuition is very good. But what I would say here is that perhaps the reinforcement learning can help tackle that problem. We can actually, as you can see here, initially the reward of all the tests are the same, but what you increasingly hear, this is a heat map of the, the values, uh, the key value of the decision tree. At the end of the training, uh, be, not necessarily the constitutive law is actually uh, become better, but more importantly, the decision making neural network are actually getting better. And it actually concentrate on the, and the key value are concentrate on a very selective set of experiment. Okay, so this is actually the score that uh, I just show here. Uh, you can see um, the details of this paper uh, can be found in these three paper. And I was saying that um, this is just uh, in, uh, some example of how to use the reinforcement learning. But in this case, what we want to emphasize, uh, and that is opposite of the first lecture is that uh, this is actually deal with a sequence of decisions that are descript and hence the gradient, uh, you, we cannot use the gradient to make a predictions. In this case, uh, we can formulate the decision as a tree and then using a statistic tools uh, to help us uh, make, uh, to help give us guideline to make a sequence of decisions that are not so clear about the values uh, uh, easily. So anyway, so with that, I think we conclude the last uh, lecture. We still have a lab sections. I think this time I finally <laughs> able to finish it within the limit time. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank the sponsor for this research. Uh, I want to thank my former student, uh, Kun Wong in particular, for tediously implement uh, everything in that free paper. And then later on, uh, you can see in, a, in, in, the, in the Jupyter notebook, you can see the, the modeling game. The first paper that the algorithm is put into the Jupyter notebook. So uh, yeah, so, and I also want to thank the audience for uh, their attention. So um, thank you. So we, <laughs> we finally managed the time better. We have about one minute for any questions. Um, any question from the live audience? Maybe, uh, I mean, let me see. Um, and also from the online chat, let's see. Okay, so um, what time will the comments start tomorrow? That's an excellent question. So JS, do you know that? The answer. Echo called the Pacific Times. Oh, so the remote, uh, so the remote uh, um, uh, conf uh, conference uh, meeting program start at five thirty a.m. Pacific time, which is eight uh, a.m. Um, uh, in the Eastern time, and then, and then yes.
Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those laptop four have, okay. So we probably would need to deal with that in the, I think that the, there should be information, there should be folder in lab four, right? I run the test myself. Uh, will the slide used today be shared later? So uh, 